And um, as our next and final speaker, we have Lenjin Okawi from Berkeley. He'll be talking about random matrices and statistics beyond covariance matrices. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much to the organizer for the invitation and, and the possibility to be here and attend this wonderful conference. So this is a bit of a survey talk. A lot of the results are old now, uh, but that uh, it's about random matrices and what they tell us in high dimensional statistics beyond maybe their traditional use in, in PCA and stuff like that. So I'm also going to start very slow to be broadly accessible and then I'll pick up space. Okay, so basically probably one of the most fundamental problems in statistics is of course linear regression. So the we have the following situation, we have n observations, n responses, and n predictors which live in RP. Okay, and yi, the response is, is a scalar, so it's in R. Um, okay, and so some simple examples of that is, is yi could be the price of a house, and xi are the characteristics of the house, or yi could be a disease indicator, uh, so it's a value, it's either zero and one, depending on whether the patient has the disease or not, and xi are health characteristics of the patient. Okay. Another application, which is more what I've been involved last year in, is internet advertising, where XI are, you know, characteristic of your browsing history, so P would be of the order of millions there, and YI might be the probability that you click on an app. Okay, and the question, of course, is we want to predict YI from XI. And the simplest method, which is for purpose of simplicity, what's going to be the focus of the talk, is linear regression. Okay, so we're going to predict YI, with y hat i, which depends on beta, which is a linear combination of the predictors. Okay? Of course, tons of variance, but let's focus on that. And now the question is, how do we find a good beta? And most of the time, it's done by solving an optimization problem. So we have a loss function rho, which will be very important. We look at the difference between our prediction here and the true observed value, and, and then we penalize this for being big, okay? And so rho is typically going to be an increasing function of the absolute value of yi minus xi transpose beta. And of course, the thing that everybody knows about is least squares, so rho of x is, is x square, okay? So no big surprises uh, there. Um, what, you know, in statistics a lot of people are interested in is beyond estimating uh, beta, and so just for the sake of notation, my estimator I'll call beta hat rho, so it depends on the loss function. Um, what we're interested in mostly is uncertainty assessment. Okay, so we want to know something about the stability of the estimator, or the stability of our prediction, or their quality, or their accuracy. Okay? So in a lot of the talk I'll assume that, or in most of the talk, I'll assume that I have a statistical model Okay, which I didn't need in the previous slide, where my response yi is actually truly a linear combination of the predictors plus some noise. Okay? Beta hat rho is my estimate of the unknown beta naught. Yi and xi are observed. Okay, that's my data set. Okay? And epsilon i is the noise and it's unobserved. And in all of the talk, it will have mean zero and variance sigma square epsilon, so the standard linear model. Okay, and so the questions we're interested in, of course, are confidence intervals for beta naught based on beta hat rho, or, which is an equivalent way of saying this, is can we find the probabilistic fluctuation behavior of beta hat rho? We might be interested in prediction performance, so if we have new observations, y nu and x nu, okay, uh, our expected prediction is going to be basically the expectation of the error we make in prediction. Okay, so on some of the data sets we learn beta hat rho. Now we look at the prediction error, maybe we square it and we take the mean of that. Okay, or the risk of the estimator, which is how good is beta hat at estimating uh, beta naught. Okay, and those in, in the talk, they're all going to be related to these quantities, so that's what I'll focus most on. Okay. Of course, this is all in L2, but you can use any metric you want, uh, and some of the results still hold. Okay. So what I'll be interested in is, first of all, where do random matrices fit in these pictures? 
And the main question for me in this talk is, or was for a while, what's the influence of dimensionality of the properties of the estimator? Okay, so P was the dimension of my predictors. And contrary to the classical statistical setup, I'm going to assume to that P over N, so the number of dimensions of the predictors over the sample size, that's going to a constant that's not zero. Okay? So that's very similar to the setup of large dimensional random matrices. Though in statistics, a lot of the work has focused on, let's say, the sample covariance matrix. So let's say for the sake of simplicity, you have observations that are Gaussian normal zero identity. Again, in P dimension, you compute the sample covariance matrix. Uh, for simplicity, I didn't recenter. And you're interested in its properties. And that's, of course, the workhorse of many statistical methods, such so as principal components analysis, which is more than 100 years old, and it's still very widely used. OK, and so there was a lot of work, especially following Ian Johnston in the early 2000s, in statistics, or some work in statistics, trying to understand the spectral properties of this matrix uh, in interesting statistical context. And the main message is that if I look at sigma hat, its behavior in low dimension, by which I mean p of n goes to zero, is strikingly different from its behavior in high dimension, which is when p of n goes to something non-zero. So in particular, when p of n goes to zero under very mild assumption, that's a good estimator of the true covariance matrix, which is here identity. And just to visualize things, here what I did is I took the previous model, so I had data that was Gaussian in 1,000 dimension. I generated 3,000 such vector. I computed the sample covariance matrix sigma hat, and I plotted the histogram of its eigenvalues. Okay? So the true covariance is the identity, so all the true eigenvalues are equal to one. That's denoted in red. And here I plot the histogram of eigenvalues, and the striking thing is that, well, that histogram is not concentrated around one. Okay, it goes from 2.5 to 0.2. Okay? So this is, of course, very well known in the random matrix theory. That's a Marchenko postural law. But basically, for the purpose of this talk, it just means that sigma hat is a bad spectral estimate of sigma in high dimensions. Okay? Even though entry per entry, it's pretty good. All right, so of course, there has been huge interest in the random matrices and statistics for almost 90 years. The Wishart paper, I think, is 90, 90, uh, 28, 1928. And a lot of renewed interest uh, in the last 25 years, maybe especially following the work of Tracy Widom, Mike Dyke, and Johansson uh, at the edge. Okay, so this is a small sample of wonderful papers written by wonderful people. It's subjective, but that's what influenced me. Okay, so a lot of the question in statistics, or at least some of the ones I was interested in, were mostly around the behavior of the eigenvalues of large random matrices, and that's important in, in multivariate statistics, in PCA, in canonical correlation analysis, and stuff like that. And the question a few years back was, you know, can these ideas be used, or are they informative uh, for understanding the high dimensional linear model, which is arguably even more important. Okay? Well, penalized version and stuff like that. So again, if you're not familiar with this, just to, to give you a feel for what's going to happen, let's say we care about least squares. We go back to the linear model, so then it's completely elementary uh, to know that there's an explicit solution for beta hat least squares. And if my linear model is true, I can write beta hat lambda this square like that. So I can compute the risk of my estimator, and lo and behold, what comes out, the trace of x transpose x inverse times the variance of the air. Okay? And so now if I use a Marchenko Pasteur law, so let's say my xi are iid normal zero identity or whatever, this of course we know the limiting spectral distribution of x transpose x. We know the shape of the histogram of eigenvalues, so we can compute this very accurately. And what it's telling us is that basically the risk of my estimator depends on the dimension, okay? So that's typically the results I'm going to be interested in. In this case, in a very particular and simple form, namely p over n divided by 1 minus p over n. So the influence of dimensionality here is extremely clear, and that's what I wanted to understand, so that's nice. 
Um, and also, there's big contrast with low dimension because in low dimension, we first say that you know this goes to zero, and then we do perturbation analysis uh, around that. Okay. So it's also easy to show. I won't get into this. That there is no statistical universality, and I'll get back to this a little bit. And the least square case is informative and easy, uh, essentially because we have explicit forms everywhere. But uh, a while back, we were interested in the situation where the loss function is more general. Uh, and so we don't have explicit forms, and so this doesn't work. OK, but this, at some level, encapsulates you know, some of the message of the talk. So I'll talk about some now old results on robust regression estimators. I'll talk about optimality results. In particular, what appeared to be at the time a new class of loss functions to use. And then I'll talk about problems with data driven methods, and in particular, the so called bootstrap. And why did I care about this p over not close to zero? Often we have better small sample approximations, okay, than, than when we assume uh, that the estimator is consistent. The, also, what we'll see is that. Using this framework and this type of analysis, it allows us to compare statistical methods at first order and not second order. So it gives us very uh, clear differencing between methods. And very often, it's consistent with practical knowledge, which I find satisfying and enlightening. Basically, by keeping p over n not going to zero, we're forced to do power series expansion when we compute the risk of estimators. Okay, If I go back to the previous slide, if I had p over n close to zero, I'll stop at p over n. But by having p over n not going to zero, I'm forced to, to keep the denominator. So of course, that is consistent generally with the first part. OK, that's better approximations. And then the problems are statistically non-trivial. And p over n can be sort of as a metric of difficulty. The flip side of this is some of the data generating model, I think, are very simplistic. And, and have their own limitations, but I'll get back to this. OK, so some risk and optimality results. As I said, these are our review. So in particular, I did a bunch of papers on this. And the first one was Bin Bickle, Lim, and you at Berkeley. OK, so again, I have my completely standard linear regression model. OK, and I believe in the statistical linear model in this case. My epsilon i's are the noise that are unobserved. And as I said before, I'm going to use what's sometimes called an M estimator, so the solution of an optimization problem, or a robust regression estimator in this case. Rho is the function. My questions are the same as before. Can I do inference on beta naught? Or another way to say that is can I put error bars on beta hat rho? Okay. This is to decide whether some coordinates of beta naught are zero, for instance. Another question is how to pick the loss function if I know a little bit about the structure of the model. Uh, and then what's the influence of the dimension or the ratio p over n on all these questions. OK. How to pick rho? Of course, it's, it's an enormously classical question. And basically, it started in the 30s with Fisher. There was tons of work on these types of problems in low dimension in the 60s and, and 70s essentially following the lead of Uber and RELS at the thesis at Yale on this in 68. More recently, some very interesting words of Dungen, Samworth, and Schumacher also. And the short answer is basically that if you know the density of the errors, which let's say that we do, the natural thing to do is to take minus the log density of the errors. OK? And What's remarkable, especially in light of what will come behind, is that it's independent of the design matrix X. So X is the n by p matrix whose i throw is xi transpose. And of course, it's consistent with maximum likelihood ideas. OK? Which is sort of, again, the workhorse maybe of optimality in statistics, if you say it in a very coarse sense. OK? So where does this come from? Well, there's a classic result of Huber, again, in the 70s. Let's say that under a bunch of regularity conditions, and asymptotically as n goes to infinity, but very importantly when p is fixed, the covariance of beta hat rho depends, basically decouples in one part that depends on the predictors x here, and one part that depends on the distribution of the errors and the loss function. Okay, so psi here is the derivative of the loss function. And basically, what matters is the expectation of rho prime square divided by the expectation of rho second square. 
Okay, so what Huber did is that he solved the variational problem associated with that and found that the optimal solution for rho was basically that. Okay, so very, very well understood, very classical. It's nice, it's all maximum likelihood, and it doesn't depend on the design. Okay, so let's be concrete. Let's do an example where I have double exponential errors, so that's the density of my errors, okay? So basically, the log of f epsilon or minus the log is absolute value. So if I believe in that, in what I just told you, which I used to, L1 should be optimal. So it's natural to think that what we have to do is, in this case, taking into account the fact that the errors are a bit heavier than Gaussian, we should use L1 regression. And that should give us basically the smallest risk. Okay? So for reason I'll explain later, I'm going to compare that with this loss function, okay, which depends on the, basically the square function, which is here. Then I add something that involves the errors, which is a convolution of a Gaussian properly scaled. You take the log of that, I scale it. And then I take the fenchel dual, fenchel dual of that, and then I take out the x square root. Okay? So this row uh, depends on p over n, because this factor here depends on p over n. The details are, are not super important for the rest of the talk. And also, it's convex. Okay, so I'll explain a bit where this comes from later. But, you know, to convince ourselves that we're not completely laid astray, we did a bunch of simulations. So here, what I'm comparing is basically the error I make when I estimate beta naught by this beta hat associated with the loss function I just described. Okay. Uh, compared to the one I make when I use L1 regression, which is what you know my classical training told me I should do because the errors are double exponential. And I do this over a thousand simulation. N is 500, so it's kind of big but not huge. And now I look at the average error I make over these 1,000 simulations uh, for this row opt and this L1 regression. Okay, And the thing that's Encouraging is that the ratio of these two errors is always less than 1. So this is 0.88. Uh, here, p over n is 0.1, and here it's 0.9. Okay? So this is as I increase the ratio p over n. The problem is harder and harder. Okay? And the performance uh, decreases, which means that the error I make relative to the L1 error is smaller and smaller. Okay? So it's interesting because we have a loss function that depends on the dimension. The ratio plays a key role, and uh, we want to understand that. And in particular, all the classical optimality results uh, clearly collapse because we beat L1, and uh, you know, when p over n is close to zero, we're not able to do that. All right. So where does this come from? Uh, basically, uh, let me explain to you a little bit what's behind this. Suppose p over n goes to a limit between 0 and 1. It's xi or iid with maybe iid entries and some moment conditions. Basically, under a bunch of regularity assumptions, this beta hat minus beta naught is asymptotically deterministic. Okay? So here I'm also assuming that the xi's are random. But anyway, this quantity that should be random is asymptotically deterministic. It concentrates. I call r rho kappa its limit. And to understand the risk of my estimator, or the limit of that, I need to solve a system of two coupled nonlinear equations. Okay? What's interesting is that so R rho kappa appears, there's a constant C that appears, and the way the loss function appears is not through its derivative, like in the Huber case, but through its proximal mapping. So the proximal mapping is a common tool in convex analysis goes back to Moreau, it's a form of projection. And there are many generalizations uh, we did, and also Donohoe and Montanari worked on that and did stuff. Uh, but the main thing for the purpose of this talk is that the risk is completely different from Huber's characterization. Okay? So to flesh out a little bit the results, if f of x is x squared, the proxy is just the scaling. Okay? If f of x is absolute value, then the proxy is self-thresholding. Okay, and in general, you can think of it as identity plus a subdifferential of f, and you take the inverse of this. And as I said, there's also very nice work of Donohoe Montanari on this. Okay, all right. 
Um, so in particular, when C goes to zero, the prox goes to identity. Another interesting aspect, and I'll explain a tiny bit where the results come from later, is, is thinking about the residuals. So what comes out directly of our analysis is that if we look at the ith residual, which is the difference between our prediction here and the observation, okay, in the asymptotic limit, we understand its marginal distribution. And its marginal distribution is the true error, epsilon i, plus again a scaling of a Gaussian, which is independent of epsilon i, by a factor that depends on the risk, so the quality of approximation, and then a nonlinear operator uh, on that, which is the prox of zero. Okay? So what's amusing is there's a non-trivial relationship between the rho, the distribution of epsilon i, and the distribution of the residuals. Okay? It's very different from the classical setting where P of n is close to zero because then the residuals are used because they're good estimates of epsilon i, again being a bit coarse. And then we'll see that, that that's very important to understand how the bootstrap behaves. Okay? Uh, and of course, uh, if P of n goes to zero, R rho kappa goes to zero, C goes to zero, so this is identity, this is zero, and we recover the classical results. Okay, this is quite dependent on the geometry of the design. Okay, so again, just to check that we were not completely doing complete nonsense, we solved the problem when, you know, we use L1 regression, the errors were Gaussian, and the thing is solvable in closed form, there's a formula, whatever, and this is relative error. So that now we did simulation compared to our predictions, and the relative error is like 6, six to the minus 3, so it seems to make uh, some numerical sense at least. Okay. So extensions on that, uh, we could work with elliptical models. So to be quick, these are models for XI, the design, with the same covariance, okay, but a very different Euclidean geometry. Uh, then the risk is very different for those models. The system is very different, okay, and optimality is, is not the same. Uh, and what that tells us is that the geometry of the point cloud is very important to understand the risk behavior. So that's similar to random matrix theory. In particular, is, is, there is no statistical universality. Okay, so changing the distribution of the entries from Gaussian to something else. In general, you have universality there, but statistically, it's not very meaningful. We can handle weighted regression and also uh, basically penalize and go much further. Okay. How does this work? I can't get into any details, but basically the story of what we did was we looked at beta hat rho is a solution of an optimization problem, so we said it's a zero of a gradient, so that requires psi to be quite smooth. And then we use concentration of quadratic forms in Xi, okay, so again, that has very strong geometric consequences, namely the norm of the Xi is near constant and the vectors are nearly orthogonal to one another. And that's why this geometry critically influences the results. There can't be statistical universality. In other words, if I change this geometry, I'm pretty sure I'll change the result. We use leave one out ideas uh, because we can't do perturbation analysis. Beta naught is not going to converge to beta hat in any strong sense. So we have to go around that and still do perturbation analysis, but by leave one out. Of course, this is tied to Martingale ideas, alive Hornstein or Burkholder. Uh, to get concentration of the norm, basically. And deep in the proof, there are lots of connections with ideas in random matrix theory and, and convex analysis. The surprise a bit, at least for me, is that it turned out to be a cast like this, at least a random matrix problem, okay? Even though it looks like you're solving a system of, of P nonlinear equations. And in particular, this constant C that was in the system a, a while back is actually the trace of the inverse of a random matrix. It looks very nice, this random matrix. It's a weighted sample covariance matrix. But the difficulty is that the weights depends on beta hat, basically. So that's what makes things a little bit tricky. OK? All right, so that's a bit the story uh, behind this. Uh, what about optimizing R rho kappa over rho? So we did the sort of natural thing, the old thing is basically we have a characterization of the risk of our estimator, okay, and we try to naturally uh, optimize our rho kappa, okay, which is a function of rho uh, over rho. 
Okay, so what's important here is, is to notice that here we have z hat minus the prox of z hat. Okay. Uh, so we did write this as a feasibility problem in our row kappa, which is you know what row are possible. And the main tool in some sense was this very beautiful results of Moreau, which says that you can represent any point as basically a projection of two things. Uh, the prox of a row of x plus the prox of the dual. And so what happened is that it became completely obvious that the right variable wasn't the loss function, but actually the prox of its dual. Okay. Once we've done this, it's very natural to try to optimize over prox of duals. Okay, so the right space to work on is proximal mappings. And then when we found the optimal in prox space, it's easy to go back to, to row. Okay, and so with a little bit of work, uh, we get this, and, and we can show it's optimal when f epsilon is, is log concave. Okay, so uh, what did we find interesting about this is that in general this row optimal changes with p over n so that says that you know we should adapt the loss function to the difficulty of the problem it's not maximum likelihood okay so the sort of classical optimality theory results uh, just don't work and are in some sense misleading here uh, though of course we recover maximum likelihood when p over n goes to zero Okay, for Gaussian errors, L2 is still optimal, and as p of n goes to 1, the performance of L2 becomes optimal. Again, this is tied to the geometry of the design, but anyway. Uh, though the limit when p of n goes to over 1 of the optimal loss is not L2. Okay, and you can also do this or approximate this with data driven approaches. So there's, as far as I know, no, no clean theory. To get a sense of what we got, here is p of n equals 0.5. Again, the loss function depends on p of n. We have double exponential errors, okay? So this is what the classical theory tells you you should use. L1 error, because I have double exponential error, so L1 loss, sorry. This is in red is least squares, okay? And in blue is, is this loss function we found, okay? It looks quadratic near zero. It looks linear uh, at infinity, so it looks very much like a Huber function, which are very classical in robust regression and in statistics. And in some sense, it's a form of smooth Huber. Okay? But the key thing is that it changes with P over N, and, and that's, I think, what made some of this interesting. The model, of course, of the design has enormous statistical limitations. This is more a way to pick into uh, you know, problems that are non-trivial. Uh, in particular, as I said, we assume concentration of quadratic forms for this system, though we can push this when we do more uh, just analysis. If you have concentration of quadratic forms, in particular, if your quadratic form is the identity, it means that your data vector are concentrated in, in norms, so they all have the same norms. They're nearly orthogonal to one another, and when you break this, you can get generally different results. In particular, if you pick an alternative design where xi has only one non-zero coordinate picked at random, then the optimality theory is totally different, the fluctuation theory is totally different, so there's not going to be any universality. But of course, this is very, very different from classical RMT. There are many other statistical limitations that have been known for a while, but still people, and they apply to a lot of situations where people use these techniques. And so it's still interesting, I think, to it was interesting to do this work to further our understanding of, of sort of high dimensional statistics. Again, spinalizing is really not complicated. Uh, it's just for cleanliness and for constant intervals, it was natural to look at uh, unpenalized models. Okay, and also connecting it to RMT was sort of nice, at least for me. So the second part is very related to the first part, but now it's, it's linked to the bootstrap. And the question, which is joint work with Elizabeth Burdum at Berkeley, is could we trust the bootstrap for these sorts of problems? Okay, so again, I have my linear model. Uh, I solve my optimization problem. And the simplest question you can ask is, you know, can I get a confidence interval for the first coordinate of beta naught based on beta hat row one? Okay? And for the non statisticians in the audience, that's just a random interval that covers a true parameter with pre-specified probability. Okay, another way to say this, if you're more probabilistically inclined, is can I understand the law of beta hat rho minus beta naught 
or the fluctuation behavior of that stuff. But now what is done is basically this is done by resampling. So by doing simulations from the existing data. And so the whole objective of this, and to a certain extent its beauty, is that you totally bypass theory. You just do a bunch of numerical work. You don't need to understand anything about designs. And it should give you the law uh, you know, of that. Okay? Uh, which is, of course, what the first part of the talk was about doing, but by pen and paper methods. Okay. So the bootstrap, of course, if uh, says you know all this, but if you're not, uh, it's really a fantastic idea. It goes back to Efron in the late 70s. Very powerful methodology. Basically, you can apply it anywhere. You have a statistical problem, and you used to do probability. Had huge impact on methodology, applied, and theoretical statistics. So hundreds of papers on this, uh, including beautiful work of all these people and quite a few others. There's interesting work of Chernozukov, Belloni, and people around them right now going on. Uh, not in high dimension, or not in what I call high dimension. And so it's very useful also in practice to introduce inferential ideas. So at Berkeley now, in intro data science, you know, the bootstrap has replaced uh, central limit theorem and stuff like that to understand fluctuation behavior. Okay, the usual takeaway message, if you take a graduate class on statistics, is that the bootstrap works for smooth statistics, okay? So smooth functionals of the data generating distribution, median, means, uh, not maximum. Uh, and for bootstrap problems related to our work, in low dimension, there's all this work of Shorak, Portnoy, Mamen, Jeff Wu in the 80s and 90s, and interesting work, more closely related to us by Bickle and Friedman also in the 80s. Okay, so as we saw above, the fluctuation theory for beta hat rho, we didn't find it completely trivial, so it was interesting to do mathematically. But that's a good test case for the bootstrap, right? And in some sense, the claim to fame of the bootstrap is people don't need theory anymore, they can just bootstrap. Let's see. So how to bootstrap in regression? There are many ways. I'll discuss two. Um, the motto of the bootstrap is just copy the data generating process. Okay, so I have a linear model. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to create a bunch of new data set that follow the data generating process. Okay, in this example, I assume that XI is fixed, and I'm going to do what's called a residual bootstrap. So I'm going to estimate beta naught by beta hat rho. OK. That's my best guess for beta naught. Then I'm going to estimate the errors here. Typically, it's done using the residuals. So yi minus xi transpose beta hat rho. And now I'm going to create capital B data set. Typically, capital B is 999 or 1,000 by basically generating new random errors by sampling IID from the residuals, which are my best guess for the true errors, or were my best guess for the true errors. Then I'm going to create a new data set that follows the linear model. OK. Xi transpose beta hat rho plus EI star. I'm using all my best guesses. And then on that new data set, which is of size n, and the predictors are of size p, I can solve my original optimization problem. OK? And I get a beta hat star, which is it's on my little beast data set, and depends on rho. OK? And I do this a thousand times. And now what do I get? I get a, what I hope, or I get an estimate of the distribution of beta hat rho minus beta naught by just looking at the histogram of beta hat star b minus beta hat rho. OK? So if this is a good estimate of the law of that, I can do inference, I can do everything I want. Uh, and at some level, I may not need probability anymore. OK. So here's the residual bootstrap. The residual bootstrap are these curves here, which are blue with a solid dot. What we did here is we looked empirically at the performance of the residual bootstrap. We built 95% confidence interval. So what that means is that 5% of the time, we're going to be wrong. Okay? And we look at the percentage of intervals that didn't cover the truth. Again, we're not asking a very hard question. We're just asking, are we covering beta naught 1? Okay? So one projection on a fixed given direction of the estimator. 
And we're looking at the coverage as the ratio P over N varies from 0.01 to 0.5. So it's 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Okay, here we have least squares, a completely trivial problem for which no bootstrapping is needed. And what we see is that the residual bootstrap has, you know, error rate about 20% here. Uh, at 0.3, it's 10%. Uh, if we look at the Uber, it's not very good either. And if we look at L1, it's also not very good. The main, if the thing worked, we'd have 5% errors across the board. So we'd see this curve, if it works, should be about lined up with this uh, dashed line. Okay, so this residual bootstrap method makes too many errors, basically. It doesn't cover the truth enough time, and therefore it's anti-conservative. Here, N is 500. Uh, you know, so P is appropriate, varies between 5 and, and, and 100, uh, 250. Okay, so this told us that, you know, there was maybe something to do. Uh, of course, bootstrapping from the residuals, even in the least squares case, what's typically advocated is to rescale the residuals, okay? Um, in low dimension, this correction is minimal, so basically whether or not you do it shouldn't change anything. But here, if my x are basically iid Gaussian, the hii here is of order p over n, so immediately that becomes non-negligible. And again, it's a good test case for all this high dimensional uh, theory. Uh, and what we see here is that when we rescale for least squares, actually the thing behaves itself. Okay, and it's a little bit maybe surprising at first, but for Huber, where there are different types of rescaling, it keeps failing. Okay, uh, so uh, again, based on the first part of the talk, it's, it's very simple to understand what's going on. We use the residuals as estimates of the error, and what we said is that in the setups we look at, okay, the residuals have this sort of marginal distribution. So they are the true error plus the Gaussian and the nonlinear as uh, transformation of this. So in particular, they have nothing to do with the true errors. Okay? So it's sort of statistically meaningless to do that. But again, if you're facing a semi-hard statistical problem, that's what you're inclined to do. Okay, so even in the least squares case, these residuals don't have the right marginal distribution, so we're not mimicking the data generating process. However, it's also obvious that in the least squares case, the only thing that matters about the distribution of the errors is its variance. So if you rescale and you get the right variance, it works. Okay? I'll qualify this in just a minute. For other loss function, it's clear that you know, this proc stuff is going to play a lot of trouble. And you can't just rescale. You have to do, or at least not in this way. Though we have some ideas for rescaling. And Bickel and Friedman worked on a very similar problem for ordinarily squared. They asked, can you find a direction where the bootstrap fails even after rescaling? And they proved that yes. So for them, the bootstrap failed. For us, after rescaling, because we're asking a much simpler question, which is, does it work on pre-given projections? It actually does work there. But of course, it doesn't work in the case we need it, where rho is not squared error. From the bootstrapping from the residuals for robust, or so M estimator has been advocated for a very long time. Beautiful paper of Shorak. Mamen in a high dimensional case where p squared over n goes to zero. It's clearly problematic for us. And again, people have worked a lot on, again, perturbation analytic ideas getting to second order accuracy in the bootstrap and rescaling the residuals, but this is just the wrong thing to do here. It's not a perturbation analysis problem. So it didn't improve the numerical results. Can we do better? Uh, yeah, we can do better, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's also the, the problems are very simple, so it's maybe too easy. So the bootstrap, the residual bootstrap, it's nice to introduce inference, but in moderate dimension, uh, you need to be careful. It fails in general. It's anti-conservative, which is particularly bad news. And you know, if, once you understand that there are problems, it's not terribly difficult to fix them, at least at the level of uh, sort of uh, numerical verification. So people might object that what's done in practice oftentimes is pair resampling. If you bootstrap the pairs, what you do is you take your pairs of observation, x, i, y, i, and you resample with replacement from that. 
Okay, so you create your new data sets like this. You get n pairs resampled with replacement. Uh, and then you solve your optimization problem on this new pair. And then again, you do inference using basically the bootstrap distribution of beta hat rho minus beta naught, which is beta hat star b minus beta hat rho. Okay? So this is least squares with pair resamplings in high dimension. And here, what we are plotting for various design is basically the size of the average confidence width of the bootstrap version versus the true correct confidence interval. Okay, and so the message here is basically that all those bootstrap confidence intervals are way too big. Okay, this is on log scale. This is to show you that there is no universality because when we go from normal to elliptical, we have very different behavior. Okay. Um, the pairs bootstrap, what happens? The confidence intervals are too big. So the pairs are the triangle here. And you see them there. Okay. So here now the method doesn't make enough mistakes. Okay. Instead of having 5% errors, we have much less than this. So maybe it's a better news, uh, but it's still not calibrated. And in terms of power, which means your ability to detect a non zero signal, uh, that's bad news. Okay. The understanding of this is fairly simple. Uh, essentially, when you do a pairs bootstrap, you end up doing weighted robust regression. Uh, you have a slight problem if p is not sufficiently big. We understood a long time ago that weighted robust regression has very different statistical properties than unweighted. Uh, and you can think of this in the least squares context that weighted robust regression changes the geometry of the data set. And because these problems are fundamentally geometric, uh, it breaks everything. Okay, here we can do some uh, theory. Um, so this is a theorem about the bootstrap. Now we use IID weights and not uh, multinomial n1 over n. We can compute basically the, the expectation of the bootstrap estimate of variance in one fixed direction. Okay, and again, it's typical in random matrix theory. You get a system of two equations that involves the dimensionality of the problem. The details of the equations are not really important. The point is that in this problem, in the designs we're looking at, the true variance should be sigma square kappa over one minus kappa, and that's not what this quantity is. Okay, so the Pierce bootstrap doesn't even get the right variance. I forget about the right distribution. The confidence intervals are too wide. The method is conservative, and it suggests weight corrections and uh, we've done some work on this, but uh, yeah. There are many other resampling techniques that exist, such as jackknifing, which we were more hopeful for. It failed again. It's easier to understand why, but uh, and it's, it fails in more predictable ways than the bootstrap. And when I was working on extreme eigenvalues of random matrices for PCA and stuff, I was often asked, why don't you bootstrap? And the reason basically is that it's just doesn't work at all. It's just uh, completely wrong. And again, that has to do with extreme eigenvalues of weighted covariance matrices versus unweighted and very different objects. Okay. Um, conclusions. So random matrices here, the advantage is it provides a unifying framework for understanding, I would say, at the precision level useful to practitioners because we can really compute the coverage of the confidence intervals and all that, it's not bounds, it's limit theorem, so they have some value, but limit theorem that kick in relatively, well, at least at the size we care about. So it sort of gives a unifying framework for a large variety of problems with high dimensional statistics uh, beyond covariance matrices, I would argue. The standard techniques and the intuition do not perform well, so if you apply standard confidence interval, you would not have the right coverage. Maximum likelihood estimators are thought to be efficient, but they're not efficient in high dimension, so you can do better. And the bootstrap fails for sort of new reasons, geometric reasons. Uh, we're very far from being able to estimate the population distributions here, which is basically the underlying assumption for a lot of theoretical statistics. Those techniques are based on, on, on perturbation analysis, Implicitly, the bootstrap is also based on perturbation analysis. Uh, so our problems and non-trivial statistical problems are not, so, so that's why it fails. Uh, those random matrix ideas taken with the limitation of the models open the way to deal with some of those hard problems. 
I think the main issue we had with the bootstrap is, is we don't know in what direction it fails. Sometimes it's conservative, sometimes it's anti-conservative. This is totally trivial, so you know we can analyze pen and paper, or maybe it's not totally trivial, but we can analyze. But in truly complicated setup with you know a million dimensional data and, and hierarchical setups, we have no clue what's going on. And you know the thing that, that was nice about these, these projects is that this random matrix theory and this large NP theory seems to capture and explain because some of those phenomena were known to practitioners in practice, in particular, which bootstraps are conservative and stuff. There's a lot of, of uh, practical literature on that. So the RIM theory explains some of that, so that gives a sense of satisfaction and closure. Thank you. So we have time for perhaps a couple of quick questions. Yep. Uh, wait for the microphone. I call here. You said the errors are log concave in your first part. Yeah. And the second question is why double exponential distribution? I mean, what about other errors? So there's so log concavity is just for optimality. Uh, we could do without log concavity, I think. Double exponential is just to illustrate. Okay. Uh, if I did least squares, I would get maximum likelihood theory, but the and organizing principle doesn't seem to be uh, maximum likelihood. So you could pick something else, and those loss functions may not be optimal, but maximum likelihood doesn't seem to be. The, the system will still work. This is sort of not sensitive to that at all. It's just the, the, the variational problem, the way we solve the variational problem of the optimization over the loss function requires at some point, because we're in proc space, so to be sure that our guess for the prox is a prox, it was sort of nice to know that it was log concave. Uh, the natural thing that we never really finished, but seemed to be that if it wasn't log concave, there's something that could be negative, which would be problematic for the prox, because prox is derivative of something that says a convex annex 2 over 2. But you could threshold that, and you would come up with loss function. So it, it's not, this is mostly technical stuff. I don't know. Then in practice, you can you know, do something really stupid like Uber. Okay. And you cross-validate on the Uber parameter, and it gives you something, you know. You interpolate between L1 and L2, yeah. you get something. But it's not particularly fascinating. Sure, thank you. Uh, can this ideas be extended to the case when P over n tends to infinity and they use uh, some regularization? In the yeah, yeah, we can do any sort of regularization over and yeah that's not really a big issue this is just to to show that the main issue I think is the design and I don't trust the geometry of the design for any practical problem but at the same time I have some strong doubts about using the bootstrap in difficult problems now because even when it's trivial it seems to be doing weird stuff so yeah but yeah this is just a sort of high level overview and there's a, a lot more to do you can do GLMs and stuff, the same sort of techniques work. But, but the, it's just always the same main idea, so. Yeah. It's a very nice talk. Uh, uh, practitioners are going to using the control There's a microphone coming that you can use. So. Uh, since Practitioners are probably going to keep using the traditional bootstrap. Do you have a, like a rule of thumb or some like a, a simple adjustment that you can propose that might help them do a better? So I would say two things. So first of all, in the company I worked for this year, they had tons of bootstrap problems. And the people doing the business side realized that the bootstrap interval were not calibrated and they stopped using it because it was giving them bad results. And then basically based on this, we can do a bunch of scalings, so we can compute some theoretical scalings, or we can do them data adaptively to get basically uh, better results. But I never really formalized this mathematically, and the, the problem is a bit that you can still bootstrap, but now your bootstrap is going to be design dependent and dimension dependent. And so you probably need to add one level of, of tuning. You can't just take standard bootstrap and tell yourself that you're estimating the correct thing because that's false. 
Now, just like in you know, least squares, you don't care that you don't have the right distribution because it just depends on the variance. In other settings, you can imagine you know, interpolating, scaling stuff, and having a data-driven method to, to pick the right scaling. And, and that should work and can maybe do theory, but uh, yeah, the theory is going to be sort of limited to these sorts of simple designs, so practitioner may object to the simplicity of the design and the complexity of the mathematics. So, but yes, I think. But it will involve one more layer of, of yeah, uh, tuning. The other problem is that scale, people don't like the bootstrap because it's too time consuming. And so being able to do theory is actually a nice electricity saving device. That's what I saw <laughs> this, work, uh, this year in, in sort of uh, large scale data analysis. So I'm afraid I'll have to cut this very interesting discussion short. And so let's thank our speakers and all of them. Thank you.